Would you like to learn how to install an acoustical ceiling for that next commercial project or even your home's basement? Armstrong's authentic 20-minute ceiling apprentice video was filmed on a real job site with real blueprints. We will review the tools that you need, plus how to determine critical installation layouts. Next, you will learn proper wall angle, hanger wire, and grid installation techniques that will have you hanging like a pro. Your installation will look so good and no one will ever know you're a 20 minute apprentice. After that, we will discuss lighting layout considerations, ceiling panel installation techniques, and helpful grid accessories from Armstrong that will make your installation look even that much better. Ready to get started? First, you will need some tools. Here are the most common tools that you will need. Pause and screenshot this checklist. You will see these tools identified and put to use throughout this video. Having the right tools and safety equipment will help to ensure a perfect, safe ceiling installation. Here are the project plans. This was an old open air camp dining hall that is being enclosed and air conditioned for more versatile use in the warm Florida climate. Our new ceilings will quiet the space while providing consistent, even lighting throughout. The interior width of this room is 28 feet 9 inches, while the interior length of the room is 68 feet 8 inches. This video will show how to center up your ceiling installation within a room for a pleasing, balanced visual. The architect may have grid layout recommendations in their plans, like main runners lined up at center of column, mullions, etc. This is important to check before your installation. A laser is crucial to use when installing today's level ceilings. Luckily, they can be purchased inexpensively from your home center or distributor. Many locations rent lasers as well. Make sure your level line laser is set to the finished height of your ceiling. This is the line that we will hang our wall angle at first. As you can see, on this project we must hammer drill holes for tap-in anchors as we hang our wall angle to the red laser line. Hard nails often work as well when attaching to concrete block. Most often, you will only be attaching to drywall. In that case, a screw gun and drywall screws or fence staples and a hammer are all that you will need to attach your wall angle to drywall. Code does not consider acoustical wall angle structural, however, it must be securely attached to the wall for a finished installation. When you get to your inside corners, a finished 45 degree miter is a much more pleasing visual than simply overlaying butt cuts. All you have to do is mark and cut a 45 degree on the lower angle, then overlay the butt cut upper angle for a perfect mitered visual from below. Your outside corners require a little more attention, but are still easy to achieve a clean mitered visual. Simply let the angle override past the corner, then square butt cut to length. Next, you want to cut away the vertical flange, leaving an exposed horizontal tab. You will do this to both angles that approach the outside corner. After overlaying them at the corner, mark where your 45 degree miter cut will occur on the lower angle. Next, raise your upper angle and make the 45 degree cut on the lower angle only. Square cut your upper angle to length and you're finished with a corner that looks perfectly mitered but is still structurally sound. A spring clamp will hold the corner into place while you do the final attachment to the wall. Now, let's figure out what width our perimeter border ceiling panels should be. This will help us determine our ultimate grid layout. Since buildings are not usually perfectly square, you know that you're going to have some border cut panels. The most pleasing visual is achieved when your border panels are no less than 10 inches wide and the opposite wall has the exact same size border panel achieving proper room balance. We're going to use the Handy Construction Master Pro calculator app, but a regular calculator will work as well. If our room is 28 feet 9 inches wide, Let's figure on installing 26 feet of full size 2x2 ceiling panels. That leaves 2 feet 9 inches of panels for our borders. 
which when divided by two, leaves us with one foot four and a half inches or 16 and a half inch border panels down each side. Small sliver four and a half inch border panels would not look good, but these 16 and a half inch border panels will look great and achieve proper room balance. Now, let's figure our borders for the remaining two sides. If the length of our room is 68 feet, eight inches, let's use 66 of that total for our full size panels and split the difference between our remaining two foot eight inches. Divided by two, that leaves us one foot four or 16 inch border panels down these other two opposing sides. To ensure that our grid installation is nice and square, it's important to install two perpendicular dry line or control line strings to serve as a perfectly square benchmark to install our grid off of. We will run our first dry line down the length of the building. We already know that the border panels here will be 16 and a half inches. Let's add 24 for the width of a full size panel. This will be 40 and a half inches and place our dry line dead center running parallel with our first main runner. We really need that dry line to be just touching the outside edge of this main runner. So after adding a half inch for a 15 16 inch main runner, this places our dry line at 41 inches off the long wall. The second dry line will run the width or shorter dimension and will line up with the center of the first full size tile. With 16 inch borders along the short wall, plus half of a full size 24 inch tile, which is 12 inches, we are left with this dry line located 28 inches off the short wall. Now, with our dry lines up representing our first main runner placement, we are ready to install our four foot on center 12 gauge hanger wires. Without the dry lines, it's difficult to know where to install our first run of hanger wires. Here, we are tying wires to the eyelag screws, but you may be shooting wires with a Hilti gun into concrete deck. After your first run of wires, simply move over four feet and install your second run and so forth. Tying wires is easy, provided you leave a long tail that you can bend up into a handle for easy wrapping, three wraps and three inches. Use of wire cutters can also aid in tying as well as shown here. Again, you want to get at least three full wire wraps within three inches to meet code. It's important that your wires drop plumb or vertical. They should always be within one and six of plumb. This means that for every inch a wire is moved to the right or left of plumb, there should be at least six inches of vertical wire drop. For example, if you move a wire two inches out of plumb, you must have at least 12 inches of vertical drop. If it is not possible to achieve a one and six wire drop, then you must countersplay an additional equally sloped wire in the opposing direction to maintain symmetry. As we install our main runners level with the wall angle, we will ultimately block our laser's horizontal line with the main runner's placement. That's easy to fix. Just lower your laser three inches and level by attaching your magnetic reflector card to the bottom of your grid as you install and level it. Our first main runner will install parallel to the first long dry line, keeping the dry line on the outside edge of the main. It's always important to have a wire in close proximity to the end of a main runner. Counting back from where we want our first main runner to end, it will be eight feet plus one foot for a total of nine feet back to the dry line intersection. Here we are putting a tape at our last wire location for the main runner splice, which will be your strongest install. We are measuring back nine feet and marking the route hole that our perpendicular dry line intersection will pass under. From this dry line intersecting location that we marked, we will measure back 28 inches, which represents from the wall to the dry line intersection. Here we will cut the main. This is important. We will repeat measuring from the dry line to the wall for each four foot on center starting main runner that we install. After that, 
Mains will continue on as full-size main runners that always end within three inches of a hanger wire location. Notice here how our perfectly measured main runner has a hanger wire hole within three inches of the main beam splice. If you are hanging mains that have a fire expansion notch, like 8300 or 7400 mains, you must add an additional wire within three inches of either side of the expansion notch. Notice how the grid is being leveled to the laser card every time a wire is attached. Again, remember to measure back from the dry line and cut your other starting main runners like you did the first one. Each starting main runner should have the same cross T route hole passing directly over the short dimension dry line. Without this preparation, your cross T's would never visually line up straight. Let's install the four foot cross T's with the first T spaced 16 inches off of our parallel starting wall. All other four foot cross T's are then 24 inches on center. Once you hear the positive click, you know that the T has engaged the route hole. When it's time to cut a four foot cross T that runs perpendicular into the long wall, butt the white flange of the T to the outside edge of the wall angle, then mark and cut the cross T to the outside edge of the parallel main runner, where the dry line is also located. Next, Simply spin the T 180 degrees and install it. It will be perfectly cut to size. Five to seven spring clamps are a must for every installer. These clamps are your extra set of hands to hold the T's in place until you are ready to permanently secure with a pop rivet. We are at the point now where we need to square our two starting main runners and their cross T's to our dry lines. This is the short line. Notice how light taps adjust the route hole directly over the dry line. Same thing goes for the main runner. Just a few light taps to bring it alongside the dry line. Our spring clamps give just the right amount of tension to let our border tees move when tapped for adjustment to the dry line. After we are certain that our grid is square to both dry lines, cross diagonally measure a 4x4 grid module. Even if all four foot cross tees are installed, measure a four by four module. If our starting grid module is square, both diagonal measurements should be the exactly the same. If they are not, push your module's four foot tees to the right and clamp to remove slack and remeasure. If you are still out, adjust your short dry line and remeasure until you are square. It is so crucially important to achieve perfect squareness at this starting corner of the room. Once this starting grid is square, the rest of your installation will continue on this way. Now that you are square, let's permanently keep it that way by pop riveting our grid to the wall angle on these two perpendicular starting walls. You may still have some cross tees to install, so do this now. When stabbing a cross T into the route hole, always stab to the right of an opposing cross T. While finishing your T's and your pop rivets, constantly readjust to the dry line if needed, because when you're finished with this starting corner and it's square, the rest of your job is virtually guaranteed to be square. Do the harder detail work in the beginning corner to guarantee the rest of the installation continues on smoothly. If you are not allowed to show exposed pop rivets or you have 9 16th inch narrow profile grid on your project, consider the GCWA or grip clip wall attachment clip. When tapped into place behind the wall angle, the GCWA has teeth that bite into the grid after squeeze with pliers, or screw holes for screw attachment. Either way, you're locked and secure. Now that our starting corner is complete, let's finish tying any remaining wires and move on. It's always best to wait and finish your final wire ties 
until the end, just in case there's any final leveling needed. Since we're talking wires here, this little accessory is a great one to have as well. If you need to splice new wires into older existing wires, like on a renovation project, or you simply need to fabricate a 20-foot wire, the WS-12 is the way to go. Our next main runners are now going up along with 4-foot and 2-foot cross tees. All that's needed is some leveling to each main with our laser level. We can be assured that our installation is square though because we took the time in the beginning to start the project off with a square installation. You'll want to keep your dry lines up and refer to them from time to time. However, the squareness should carry on. When it comes time to splice two 12-foot main runners end to end, simply stab to the right of the opposing main runner. When you hear a click, your connection is tight and locked with over 300 pounds of pull-out resistance. How do you take main runners apart? It's real easy. Just grab the slotted screwdriver and bend your pocket tabs on either side of the main out 90 degrees. When you are ready to splice them back together, simply bend the tabs back into place and stab them together again for the same tight connection as before. Our grid installation is really starting to take shape, with mains and tees expanding exponentially in two directions. We talked about the strength of the main splice and its removability, but what about the cross tees? Well, once engaged tee to tee, it will take 300 pounds to pull them apart. How do you disengage cross tees? With a flathead screwdriver, depress the cross tees outward locking tabs on both sides of an intersection. With two hands, rotate the main beam away from you. Then, disengage the cross tee you are trying to remove upward. Here's a real life example. Here we are pushing the locking tabs on both sides. Now comes the rotation of the main runner. Before reinstalling, just bend the locking tab back out at a 45 degree angle. Our main runners have come to the end of our 68 foot building run. How do we accurately cut a main runner to size at the opposing wall? Just butt the end of the main to the wall upside down. Then cut back as far as the pocket tab on the main runner above you. Next, rotate your cut main 180 degrees and reinstall. Okay, we've reviewed dry line and hanger wire installation, then main runner installation, followed by four foot and two foot cross T installation. Let's talk about light fixture layouts. The architectural plans had our two x four lights running north and south on the plans which means we were supporting the two foot ends of the fixtures on the main runners, which is as it should be. What if light fixture direction changes within a room after the grid has been installed? This would only place one side of the light fixture on a main instead of the required two sides. In this case, a four foot cross tee must bridge perpendicularly the other two four foot cross tees. These bridging cross tees must now act as main runners and have the same carrying capability as the main runner. Refer to your grid's data page to determine which four foot cross tee matches your main runner's load carrying capacity for bridge tee installations. Here we are installing a four foot cross tee to create our four foot module. This four foot bridging tee must match the other two perpendicular four foot tees in main beam carrying capacity. We are followed by a single two foot cross tee to create our 2x2 two two ceiling panel openings. Here you see the wire supported main on the left and the bridging tee on the right. Let's talk about staggered or off module grid installations. When installing a light fixture with unopposed cross tees or the newly popular staggered module installations, you need to lock unopposed tees into place. For this, use the STAC clip which takes the place of an opposing cross T while securing the single T tight in the module. 
a pop rivet holds the module and T tight in even seismic areas. If you're having to install custom sized tees or modules where a cross tee route hole does not exist, cut the tabs off your tee or use a scrap piece of main runner and rest it up in the module where you need it to be. After clamping in place, use a GC3W or Grip Clip 3-way. This handy clip allows placement of a fabricated tee where a cross tee route hole does not exist. It can either be secured by activating the locking barbs with pliers or screws in a screw gun. Either way, your job fabricated tee is secure and ready to receive a light fixture or air diffuser. Well, our grid is up, square, and finished. Let's spend a few minutes on ceilings, specifically cutting border panels. For a square edge border panel, butt your tape to the wall and measure to the inside edge of the grid for your measurement. Dragging the end of your tape along the face of the panel is a great way to transfer your measurement before cutting. It should take two to three cuts with a utility knife to make it through your panel. For a tegular panel, replicating that tegular reveal at the perimeter is easy once your panel has been cut to the proper length. Just drag your knife along the panel using the wall angle as a guide. Remove the panel and cut down through the face just the depth of the reveal, about 5 16 of an inch. Next, back cut along the edge the same depth to remove that corner piece. Then reinstall and see your perfect custom cut reveal. If you have to cut circular cutouts for can lights or sprinkler heads, with a tape, mark the center of your cut location. Next, use a compass to scribe and outline your circular cut on the face of your panel. Using a keyhole saw, Cut out your circle and you're ready for your fixture. Finally, upon completion, if you notice any paw prints left over from installing, a dry chemical eraser does a great job erasing those little smudges from the face of your panels. If you have a blemish that's a little bit more severe, Supercoat Sealing Touch-Up Paint is available from your local distributor for touching up those deeper gouges, etc.